Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 111, Hooing and Herring. On its east side, the sea breaks through and cuts off the western side of Skerne, and this sea commonly yields each year an abundant haul to the nets of the fishes. Indeed, the whole sound is apt to be so thronged with fish that any craft which strikes on them is with difficulty got off by hard rowing, and the prize is captured no longer by tackle, but by simple use of the hands. So writes the late 12th century Danish chronicler Saxo Grammaticus about Zeeland, the island he believed to be the most delightful province and heart of Denmark. In the year 1400, 550 ships arrived in Lübeck from Zeeland, bringing 65,000 barrels of salted herring to the city at the mouth of the Travel River. But that was only a fraction of the total that is estimated to have been as much as 300,000 barrels of herring a year that were caught in the narrow sound between Copenhagen and Malmö, and then processed in a giant temporary market town on Skerner Peninsula. All these vast quantities of fish were needed to feed the European population, who had not only acquired a good dose of piety, but also as many as 140 fast days a year when the consumption of hot-blooded animals was banned. How the trade in Baltic herring became a monopoly of the Hanseatic League and the backbone of its trading network is what we will discuss in this episode. No worries, it is not just about salting techniques and the difficulties of shipping a load of fish over thousands of miles, there will be a battle with knights and everything, and an extended detour into the largest copper mine in Europe that funded the Thirty Years' War. I hope you'll enjoy it. But before we start, let me tell you that the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com slash support. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Carsten H., Marilyn M. J., Brandon, and Stefan D., who've already signed up. Ah, and a bit of housekeeping. In episode 109, I said that St. Olaf's Yard in Novgorod was named after the Swedish king St. Olaf. Now, that was not accurate. Even though the Gotlanders were nominally Swedish subjects, they worshipped King Olaf of Norway in their church in Novgorod. Sorry about that. I'm not sure how that happened, but it did. We'll try to do better next time. As for the more accurate parts of the podcast, we ended last week with the opening up of new trade routes to Novgorod and Smolensk via what is today Latvia and Estonia. The cities that were founded there, most prominently Riga, Rival, modern-day Tallinn, and Doprat, modern-day Tartu, had joined together with Visby into one of the regional subgroups of the Hanse, the Thirds or Drittel in German. Theirs was called the Livonian Third. Now, the Livonian Third's main trade was in the eastern wares, the beeswax, fur and silk road wares that came in via Novgorod and the Dnieper River. They also had one more trade we have not talked about, and that was the trade with Sweden. Now, when I think of Swedish exports, I think obviously of ABBA, Tetra Pak, IKEA and mobile phones. But for centuries, Sweden's biggest exports were metals, and in particular, copper. And when I say centuries, I really mean centuries. There is archaeological evidence that some mining activity took place as far back as 850 AD at the mine at Falu Gruva, about 200 kilometers northwest of Stockholm. This enormous deposit at some point provided two-thirds of Europe's copper supply until it was finally closed in 1992. Copper from Falu Gruva did not only cover the roofs of the Palace of Versailles, but it's also the base material for some of the most iconic images we have of Sweden, the red-painted wooden cottages. That red paint was made from the sludge of the mine, mixed with water, rye flour, linseed oil and other ingredients to produce an excellent anti-weathering cover. Falu Grova was one of the most important, if not the most important, economic activity in Sweden. It funded most of its wars when Sweden was a European superpower, paying for Gustav Adolf's rampage across the German lands in the Thirty Years' War and Charles XII's unintentional trip to Constantinople. As the Regency declared, this kingdom stands or falls by the Great Copper Mountain. So, 
what has all that to do with the Hanseatic League? Well, quite a lot, actually. German merchants showed up in Sweden almost right from the beginning. Sometimes around 1173, Henry the Lion had managed to get an agreement with the King of Sweden that protected their merchants and allowed the Germans to settle in Swedish cities. And that process accelerated after the former trading and royal center in Sigtuna was destroyed by raiders from across the Baltic Sea. In 1252, the country's regent, Bilger Jarl, invited German merchants and artisans to come and help building Sigtuna's replacement, the newly founded city of Stockholm. Now, Stockholm never became entirely a city of foreign merchants like Riga or Tallinn, nor did Sweden get taken over by a German-speaking ruling class as Latvia and Estonia had been. But the German population had a major and sometimes dominant position inside the major cities, in particular in Stockholm. They brought their customs and ideas about city governance to their new home. The Swedish language, too, has been heavily influenced by the low German the Hanseatic merchants spoke. Many terms, in particular those relating to artisan products, trading and politics, have their roots in Lower German. Whether the German influence on the Swedish language was indeed as significant as that of Norman French on the English language, I'm not entirely convinced. But if any of you is a Swedish linguist, I would love to hear what you think. These Germans, who came to Sweden, were initially attracted by the opportunity to export agricultural products, in particular butter, as well as furs. But when our intrepid Hansa merchants got wind of this mountain of copper out there in the wilderness, they realized they had accidentally hit on the jackpot. Though the mining in Falugruva had begun in the 9th century, it wasn't a particularly professional operation. Most of the miners were farmers in their day job and went down to look for copper in their spare time. The Lübeck merchants, on the other hand, knew about the most professional mining operation in northern Europe the great silver mine in Goslar. And there they recruited mining professionals to come up to Falo Gruva and develop this abundantly large deposit. Like the merchants in Stockholm, the miners from Goslar brought with them their traditions and ways to organize things. They were free men with highly sought-after skills, hence they were given wide-ranging privileges to elect their own representatives who negotiated their pay, who settled disputes within the community and set standards for the safety and operation of mines. The mine hence functioned largely autonomous, just overseen by a royal official. Now as for the ownership of the mine itself, that was split between Swedish nobles and the German merchants from Lübeck and Stockholm. In 1347, King Magnus visited the mine and felt a fundamental reorganization was needed. He laid out the respective rights and privileges of the mine owners and master miners, probably based on how things had supposed to work since the 13th century. Interestingly, this document keeps getting cited as the incorporation document of Stora Kappersberg Bechsbelaget AB, a subsidiary of Stora Enze, one of Sweden's large industrial conglomerates. If true, it would make Stora Enze indeed the oldest joint stock company in the world. And whilst the New York Times and Al Gore are pushing the story, many historians are doubtful of that notion, given that the mine owners and master miners were a long way from pooling their resources and in the latter's case an even longer way from lounging about and drawing dividends. What is however not much in dispute is that until the late Middle Ages, Lübeck merchants dominated the copper export business out of Sweden. Even the German merchants in Stockholm struggled to get a look into that one. We know that between 1368 and 1370 just nine Lübeck merchants accounted for 60% of the copper exports from Sweden, a level of concentration most unusual in the Hanseatic League. Now, apart from copper, iron ore was another important Swedish export, though we're still a long way from the days when Sweden was one of the largest sources of iron ore in Europe, in particular for the Ruhr. While Sweden was cursed into selling its most valuable resource via Lübeck, and only via Lübeck, their neighbours to the west, the Danes, too found themselves cornered by the aggressive Hanseatic merchants for their most valuable commodity, the humble herring. Today, we eat very little herring, which is a shame, since this oily fish can be absolutely delicious. But it isn't just its taste that made it the Middle Ages' favorite fish. Herring have a number of great advantages. The first one is that they often move in large schools, as solitary herring are getting quickly confused and lost. The name herring may go back to the old High German word herry, 
meaning lots or many. All you need is finding a place where there is a school of herring that passes regularly and you can catch them on an industrial scale. And herring are exceptionally good at reproducing. A female herring lays 30,000 eggs on average that she lets drop to the bottom of the spawning grounds, after which the male herring release a cloud of milt over the same area. Whoever said romance is dead? What is particularly helpful is that different herring populations spawn at different times so that there is less seasonality with these fish. And finally, herring tend to return back to the spawning grounds where they have been conceived, going down that same route every year. In the Middle Ages, Baltic herring would spawn somewhere in the Baltic Sea, we do not know exactly where, and then move out into the North Sea from where they would return between July and September. Now, if you've been good at geography or can find an atlas, take a look at the connection between the North Sea and the Baltic. Yep, right across that entrance into the Baltic lay two massive islands, Fyn, Fynen, and Zeeland. There is a way through, but the navigationally challenged herring tend to go through the straighter gap called the Öresund, which is just four kilometers wide at its narrowest point. And that is where every summer millions of herring pass through, making good old Saxo Grammaticus claim that you would get your boat stuck if you tried rowing across. And another great advantage of the humble herring is that it's very oily. That means it's easy to preserve. It can be pickled as much as smoked as kippers or simply salted. There we are. A near inexhaustible supply of fish, caught in a geographical net laid out cunningly by Slarty Bartfast and ready to be salted, pickled, smoked or otherwise cured, for its long journey across Europe. A Europe where there are 140 days a year where the consumption of warm-blooded animals was forbidden. And since not everyone fancies alligator, lizard, puffin or weirdly beaver, the majority of those who could afford animal protein opted for fish. That leaves one question. Who will get all the money from the Bonanza? Another look at the map gives you the answer, right? Both shores of the Öresund were part of Denmark for a large chunk of the Middle Ages. So surely it's the king of Denmark who will be shipping that most desirable commodity all across Christianity. Well, we know he didn't. But why was that? Now, one reason was often believed to have been the Battle of Bornhövet. In this rather epic encounter where fighters on both sides waded through blood and the king of Denmark lost an eye, the future of the Baltic region was decided for a few centuries to come. In that battle, King Valdemar II of Denmark, son of Valdemar the Victorious, faced the Counts of Holstein and Schwerin, the Dukes of Saxony and Mecklenburg, the Bishop of Bremen and troops from Lübeck and Hamburg. On Valdemar's side was Otto the Child, grandson of Henry the Lion and not many others. Before he was so crushingly humiliated, Valdemar II had been riding high. He had expelled the Counts of Holstein, had fought over the Archbishopric of Hamburg-Bremen, had run a crusade into Estonia, forced the Dukes of Mecklenburg and Pomerania under his suzerainty. Even Lübeck had become part of his Danish Empire. Young Emperor Frederick II, still fighting with Otto IV at the time, had to accept these changed circumstances and borders in 1220. Valdemar's problems began when he fell foul of one of his recently acquired vassals, the Count of Schwerin, over a property deal that had gone sour. Or because he was sleeping with the Count's wife. Or both. When I talk about property here, I mean a whole county, not just a detached villa with delightful views. The Count of Schwerin responded by imprisoning the king and his son when they came over for a relaxing hunting party in 1223. Now, the Count of Schwerin needed allies since the friends of Valdemar, including the Pope, put pressure on him to release the king. The allies of the Count of Schwerin were the sworn enemies of Valdemar, Count Adolf IV of Holstein, who had been expelled from his lands, and Bishop Gephard of Hamburg-Bremen, who had shared the experience. Two years into the imprisonment of King Valdemar, his son-in-law, a member of the Wittina clan, musters the energy to come up and try to free him. But Count Adolf IV and Bishop Gebhard cut that short, and the next family member joins Valdemar in his certainly most comfortable prison in the castle of Dannenberg. At that point, Valdemar realizes the game is up and starts negotiating. But the terms are tough. Return the lands of the Holsteins, the Schwerins and the bishops, 
release the newly acquired vassals in Mecklenburg and Pomerania from their oaths, pay 45,000 marks of silver and just generally foxtrot Oscar. Waldemar did sign on the dotted line and went back home to Denmark, fully intent on doing not a single thing on that long list of concessions. Instead, he raised an army and got back to the job of conquering Alstein. He has some initial success and forces the Dietmarscher, the free peasants who live like the ancient Germanic tribes, back into his army. He also finds support from the House of Wealth in the form of Otto the Child, who by now is no longer a child, is just called that. His opponents have also been busy recruiting new members and can now secure the Duke Albrecht of Saxony, one of Albrecht the Bear's descendants. On July 27, 1227, it's showtime. Either side sets up in the usual order of a central contingent with the king on one side and Count Adolf IV on the other, plus two wings each. Behind the Danish army were the Dietmarscher as a reserve and behind the German princes, the Mecklenburger. That is about as much battle order there was, because once the two armies had made contact, it's the usual medieval man-against-man fighting. The whole process dragged on for a long while and hence casualties were high on both sides. There are many different versions of what ultimately decided the battle. There is the apparition of the Virgin Mary displaying an unexpected fondness for kidnappers, and a more credible story that the Dietmarscher swapped sides in the midst of the battle. Or it was simply that one side was hammering harder and longer than the other one. In any event, Waldemar was injured and fled the field of battle. The net result of this encounter was decisive. Waldemar gave up all ambitions on the lands south of the Eider River, meaning the Holy Roman Empire returned back to its borders that Frederick II had so carelessly sacrificed. This border will play an important role in the intractable Schleswig-Holstein question that according to Lord Palmerston's famous quote only three people ever really understood. I'm confident you will remember all that when we get there in about, well, say three years. Adolf IV, the Count of Holstein, regained his county and some more. The Schauenburgers will from here on out be major players in Danish politics. Mecklenburg and Schwerin returned to being imperial princes instead of Danish vassals. Albrecht of Saxony gained Lauenburg and Ratzeburg. The Dietmarscher moved into nominal vassalage of the Bishop of Bremen, but basically now lived entirely as a free peasant republic until 1599. And, many hundreds of miles north, the Livonian brothers of the sword used the weakness of the Danes to take Tallinn and fill it up with German merchants. Basically, instead of having one dominant political power in the Baltic Sea, there were now many medium-sized ones, none of which strong enough to stand up to the Hanseatic League. And Lübeck? Lübeck gets extended privileges as a free imperial city, making it entirely independent of any of the neighboring powers. And in the traditional telling, the augmentation of Lübeck and the fall of the King of Denmark allowed the Hanse merchants to grab hold of the herring trade in Scania. But that's not quite true. I mean, yes, a week in Denmark is a good thing for the merchants, but as it happened, King Waldemar had been a great sponsor of Lübeck and had invited them to come to Scania to trade herring long before his defeat in 1227. The reason the Danes allowed the Hanse in was the same reason why the Gotlanders took them along to Novgorod. It was all about that white gold, salt. Salt that Lübeck merchants could procure from Lüneburg, from Oldesloe and from Halle an der Saale. Without salt, the herring could not be preserved or at least not in the quantities required. So the Lübeckers traded their salt for access to the trade in herring. Though the Danes had no salt, the Hanse merchants weren't the only ones in the whole wide world who had salt. There was the Bay of Bourneuf. Never heard of it? Me neither. But in the Middle Ages, this bay on the western French coast, just south of where the Loire enters the Atlantic, was the largest source of salt in Europe. The bay used to be significantly larger than it is today because the vast salt fields, where they evaporated the water and collected the valuable white crystals, had shifted the coastline 20 kilometers westward. In the early 13th century, it was mainly Dutch-English merchants who collected the salt there and brought it to Denmark to salt the herring. They then took the barrels of salted herring back to England or Holland for onward distribution. Now, in the absence of their own salt, the Danes' role in the herring business was limited to catching the actual fish 
and to organize the trade. In the Middle Ages, commerce went either through major trading centers where merchants would live all year round, like say Venice or Constantinople, or it would happen on fairs, where merchants from all over would get together on specific dates to exchange wares. Whether it was organized as fairs or as permanent establishments was a question of whether there was enough trading volume in a place all year round. The most important fairs in the early Middle Ages were those of Champagne in France. These were six annual get-togethers of merchants from Flanders, Italy, Spain, Germany that took place in four cities, Foix, Provence, bar sur aube and Lagny, each lasting about six weeks. The advantage of the fair was that it concentrated demand and supply by artificially constraining the time trading could happen. It is a bit like stock exchanges used to have limited trading hours so that everybody was compelled to bring their buy and sell orders in at the same time. The champagne fairs declined as the European economy grew and trade expanded. Once there was enough demand and supply to sustain trade flow throughout the year, they got bundled into one place which for Northern Europe at the time was Flanders, in particular Bruges. Later that went on to Antwerp, then Amsterdam, and finally London. The fair that the Danish king set up on the small peninsula of Skarno Falsterbro was seasonal, less because of the lack of sufficient demand, but because of the seasonality of the supply. The herring only appeared between July and September. If you go to the Skarno Peninsula today, you are likely to come for the vast sandy beaches or to see the Falsterbo horse show. But these rather modest little towns had once been one of the most important economic centers in Europe. The fair was organized as follows. Each of the trading cities was given a specific area on that peninsula, a so-called Witte, where they could process and sell the herring. On these enclosures, the merchants would establish wooden sheds or houses in which to process the herring and then store the supplies. The Witten of Lübeck and of Danzig Gdansk were the largest, each about 6 to 10 hectares, all filled with wooden buildings. As I said, catching the herring was largely reserved for Danish fishermen. They would lend their catch and the merchants would buy it off their boats and bring it to their factory. There, mostly Danish and German women would clean and then salt the fish, put them into barrels. Once that's done, the merchant might either sell his herring right there at the fair or have it shipped to their hometown. The amount of shipping that got into Skana was truly astounding. Lübeck alone sent 550 ships annually, some quite small, but others able to take 400 barrels of herring down to the Trava River. In 1400, there were 900 registered herring importers from Lübeck. Estimates range from 200,000 to 300,000 barrels of herring getting shipped from Skana, when the place was at its peak. Lübeck accounted for 65,000 of them, so if we extrapolate from there, we're talking about literally thousands of ships going in and out of that place, a place that did not even have a real harbor, so that all these barrels had to be rolled down to the beach, put on a dinghy or small boat, and then transferred to a larger vessel. Such a massive congregation of merchants always meant that other things than herring would be traded as well. And since only some of the merchants came from the Baltic and others from Holland and England, each bringing different wares, the fair quickly became a major exchange for cloth, fur, beesmax, salt, spices, silk, butter, grain, and anything else the medieval mind desired, not just herring. Thousands of people came to work on the Witten, to salt the herring, to bring the fish ashore, to ship goods from land to shore. There would have been entertainment put on for all these people who stayed there for a few months, Plays, jugglers, musicians, basically an enormous festival, one of Europe's greatest and most profitable parties. In all the revelry, there was something that irritated our Hanseatic merchants, and that was the presence of what they called the Umlandfahrer, the traders who came in from the North Sea, from Holland and England, to buy the herring and sell their cloth. And these guys also had access to the resource that we have seen sits at the heart of Hanseatic influence, the salt. The approach the Hanse took to squeeze them out was twofold. One was to send their own ships out to the Bay of Bourneuf and bring back the sea salt from there and on the next journey stop in England and Flanders to sell the herring. And that was a particular necessity for those Hanseatic cities that did not have ready access to the salt of Lüneburg, Halle and Oldesloe, like, for instance, Gdansk. Thanks to increasingly aggressive tactics, the Hanseatic merchants crowded the Umlandfahrers out of the herring trade. 
And finally, in the late 14th century, the Hanse fought multiple wars with Denmark, we'll discuss in more detail later. These being successful, the Hanseatic League took over Skanner for a period and formally expelled these non-Hanseatic traders, thereby creating a monopoly for Scania herring. Did it work? No, actually, it didn't. By the late 15th century, herring exports from Scanner had dropped from 300,000 to 50,000 barrels. The big trading fair was a mere shadow of its former self. No more trade in anything but herring. Fewer ships, less entertainment, no major bands come into play, just a lonely dude with greasy hair and a Bontempi organ. This decline in the herring trade was in part a function of the expulsion of foreign traders. The Hanseatic merchants were now shipping all that beeswax fur, cloth and so forth directly to destinations without stopping in the Ursund. All this had also coincided with a decline in the number of herring that passed through the Ursund. We know that their numbers declined, but the exact reason is unclear. My money is on the most obvious, overfishing. Herring tend to go back to the places where they were born. If one takes out a lot of herring who go back and forth into the Baltic, their North Sea cousins and competitors will take over their feeding grounds, leading to a gradual decline in the population. There may also have been an impact from the shift in the climate that sets in from the 13th century onwards. In any event, the Baltic herring supply gradually declined in the 15th century and was replaced by North Sea herring, caught by Dutch fishermen and distributed by the emerging Dutch trading centers of Amsterdam and Delft, etc. What finally did for the herring trade was the Reformation, which abolished the concept of fast days and forcibly eating of fish, cutting off quite a lot of the end market. But this is still a long way away. Next week we'll talk again about fish, but this time about dried cod, halibut and hake from Norway. And we'll talk about grain, about the cities founded along the coast of Mecklenburg, Pomerania and into the lands of the Teutonic Knights, and finally about how the Hanseatic League uses its economic muscle to make the contour of Bergen the monopoly in the trade of Norway's main export. I know, I promised to do that last week, but I got waylaid by the story about the Swedish copper which I think was worth it. Oh, wasn't it? You should know that this project is as much a journey of discovery for me as it is for you. I do usually know roughly what I will talk about in the next two or three weeks. But the actual research takes place in the days before the recording, and if I find something interesting, I tend to dig deeper, even if that means the schedule gets a bit messed up. So let's see what I will dig up for next week. I hope to see you then. And before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash history of the Germans. It is thanks to you this show does not have to do advertising for products you do not want to hear about. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet a post from the history of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others, hence bring in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes. And last but not least, the bibliography. For this episode, I again relied heavily on Philipp Dollinger, Die Hanse, definitely my go-to book for this season, then Die Hanse, Lebenswirklichkeit und Mythos, herausgegeben von Jürgen Bracker, Volker Henn and Rainer Postel, Rolf hammel Kieslow, Die Hanse, now, if you want to know about the story of the Swedish copper mine, have a look at the Falu Grova website. Or go to the UNESCO World Heritage site about Falu Grova and look through the application for the inclusion on the World Heritage list, which gives a very detailed account of the mining activities here. And finally, I have to thank the Scandinavian History Podcast, which helps me understanding the Danish, Swedish and Norwegian perspective on these events. Links to all of these are be found in the show notes. <music>